When launching a short-term rental property, it's important to do two things well. You wanna be able to come in on budget and you wanna be able to get it done on time. If you're holding a property for too long, you lose money. Of days that you could have put it on the rental market if you did it faster. And then if you spend too much money on stuff, it's gonna take you way longer to get your original investment back. It could actually affect your profitability. Imagine spending $50,000 on a property that you could have done for 15. That $35,000 has to come from somewhere, right? So in this video, I'm talking more so about what to save money on, but what to spend the money on as well. Okay, so there's gonna be some things that you just have to come out of pocket for if you wanna be competitive, if you wanna get bookings. And there's some stuff that needs to be in your house, but it doesn't need to be the pricey version of something because people just don't ever interact with it. It's good to have and it stays on the wall, something like that. So in this video, we're gonna teach you what to spend money on. And this might even help you stage faster because you can just kind of make the decisions you need to make and get your place filled up and put it on the short-term rental market. My name is Sean Rocky G. Chen. As you guys know, I've been in the game for about seven years. I'm nearing by now the 150 property mark. I don't have an exact count because as you guys know, Haley runs the business. Jason picks up the properties, Haley runs the properties, and they added 35 properties while I was gone at Burning Man and 20 more are being staged as we speak. So let me teach you from my seven years and multiple hundreds of properties experience, how to do short-term rentals in this video. Let's jump in. Welcome back, YouTube world. You know, I realized something. I had an identity crisis with this channel a while ago and I wanted to make fun content. You guys aren't here for fun content. You guys are here for the serious stuff, the how-to stuff. And if you guys wanna go watch entertaining stuff, I'm sure you have plenty of YouTube channels to go and watch. So thank you for coming here because if you're here, that means you actually care about growing a short-term rental business. And you guys understand that this is a place where you can get some value to do so. And I'm so happy to give that to you. You want a relationship with the value, hit the subscribe button because that's what I laboriously do here is find things that will actually move the needle for you in your short-term rental business. With that said, let's start saving some money on products that you don't need to spend money on. Number one is the toaster and other auxiliary kitchen appliances that are rarely used. So in some cases, if your listing is small enough, you do not need a blender. You do not need a rice cooker. You arguably don't even need the toaster. Okay, um, so in studio one bedroom apartments, we do not buy blenders. We do not buy ninjas, we buy nothing. We don't buy rice cookers, none of that. We don't buy a regular kettle, we'll buy an electric kettle. Um, and those things can be like $12 on Amazon. So you can go cheap on things like an electric kettle. You can go cheap on things like toasters. Now on that topic, when we're looking at the kitchen, the little stuff, there's some things that you should not go cheap on like silicone cooking utensils. If you buy the really cheap plastic Walmart ones that chip and scrape, they look nasty fast and you're gonna to have to replace them fast. If you buy Teflon pans, they're gonna scrape fast, you're gonna to have to replace those fast. If you buy cheap, thin metal pans, they're gonna warp and break and stuff and all that. So we go with ceramic pots and pans and silicone plated utensils, and those aren't really expensive. We'll get a pot and pan set for 80 bucks, we'll get the silicone utensils for under 30. So you don't have to go heavy on those things, but you can definitely save by not buying a blender, not buying a toaster, or buying a cheap toaster. Until you get to like a three bedroom property, then you start to add in a lot of those other auxiliary kitchen stuff because you're gonna be servicing more families. Somebody's gonna be cooking at home. So at three bedrooms, we add serving trays, multiple baking sheets and cutting boards, not just one of each. We'll add a rice cooker, we'll add a blender, and we'll add all those little extras that really make a kitchen ball out because there might be someone in the family that really loves their kitchen space and they're gonna choose your three bedroom because your kitchen is decked out. Number two might be controversial, but we don't put TVs in the bedroom. We put TVs in the main room and we'll do like a 45 or 55 inch Amazon Fire Smart TV and then we will share our streaming services. So we have, like I said, hundreds of properties, but we might have 10 streaming services. And the reason why is you can save money here through the concept of congruent watch time, or is that the right word? Congruent? The word slips me, it's not congruent, but what it is, is when multiple people are watching TV at the same time, that is the only time that it really matters that you have multiple streaming services. So if you have two or three Netflix accounts, two Amazon Primes, one HBO Max, one Disney Plus, now that House of the Dragon is out, maybe two HBO Max accounts, and you can have 10 streaming services through 100 plus TVs. One person might be watching TV here, one person might be watching TV there at the same time. Some people watch TV at 10 p.m., some watch at 10 a.m. Very rarely are 100 TVs ever going to be on at the same time. So you can save money by not getting new streaming services for every single TV that you buy. And I argue that you don't even need TVs for the bedroom. And this is the one that's controversial because some people like sound in the bedroom, right? Some people like to go to bed watching TV. I don't think it's worth the extra $350. If you have a multiple bedroom property, maybe in the master, you could put a TV in there. So somebody has that option. As you go bigger with listings, you stop cutting corners to hit a certain budget. 
And as you go more luxury, you also never cut any quarters because luxury is probably the most competitive space for short-term rentals and it has the best professionals in the space. So people with the most experience and it's also the hardest customer type to please. So as you go luxury, if you screw up the little things, people won't book your place and they'll give you bad reviews and you'll just go into this downward spiral. So one pro tip here is if you're new, don't do a luxury property. You need to learn how to do short-term rentals before you learn to do luxury short-term rentals. There are like echelons to this. Don't jump to like the, the world-class property type because you're just gonna get beat up by world-class competition. Number three, plants. You need some form of greenery in the space, but it doesn't have to be real. And what gets really expensive are housekeepers that don't take care of plants. And especially if you don't have a green thumb, you'll probably buy the wrong plants and they'll die. You'll spend more money on a real plant because you thought it was cool and it dies in 10 days or a month. And then you have to go buy another one and it dies again. And then you get traumatized because you're this plant murderer in your short-term rentals and you eventually switch to plastic only after going through the trauma of knowing that you just like ruined a small forest in your Airbnb properties. So go with plastic plants if you have not the ability to care for real plants. And if you're using a third-party short-term rental cleaning company, I wouldn't trust them to water real plants either. So unless you're like some like really good horticulturist, botanist person who sets up like this irrigation system and that's expensive, then use fake plants. You need to have them present in a space to really make a space look more like a home, but you shouldn't go nuts on stuff like this because obviously you need to come in on budget. So if you're doing studios or one bedrooms, you might have one really tall plant, maybe two, and then you have a few smaller ones. I like to have a tall plant in every single bedroom. I like to do that because it really helps make the space. Things that I always have is a stand-up mirror and a tall plant in bedrooms. The stand-up mirrors are like 80 bucks. Tall plants are like 60, 50 bucks at Target or Ikea. So they're not really expensive, but I think they help with the photography of a home. Right? When you go and shoot your space, you want the space to look complete. So tall plants and stand-up mirrors really do help with that. Next, let's get to things that you should not try to cut corners on. It's very specifically, make sure you spend good money on these items. You can still be a smart buyer, but you cannot slouch. You cannot disregard and just buy the cheapest things out there. Number one is the bed and the pillows. That's so important. The place really gets rated is on its sleep experience. I believe that you should always have a king bed in every space, no matter what. And if you have a king bed, you should have two different types of pillows. So a total of four, two of each. And that allows different types of sleepers with different firmness requirements and stuff like that to be able to enjoy their sleep because you gave them variety. And that king bed shouldn't just be some cheap box spring, like coil king bed. You should really consider what type of king bed to buy. And I do have a link in the description on stuff that I do buy, obviously. So the quality of sleep is gonna be one of the most important things, even on a budget property. Number two is the couch. Now the thing about the couch is it really makes the space. And if you don't pick a couch that is maintainable and durable, you're gonna have a problem. Cheap couches and cheap chairs at a, at a dinner table, they'll break so fast because they are one of the most interacted with pieces of furniture in the whole home. People sit on the chairs, they sit on the couch. And if you're not careful, you buy super cheap, like the futons that barely screw together or the couches that have like plywood feet. Those things just break so fast. I mean, I remember when we launched in Philly, we bought some really cheap couches. We ended up having to like reinforce the bottom middle. So I had a handyman go in after a couple broke. We had to put like little trusses at the bottom of these love seats because they just broke, because people do stuff on couches. They do stuff on couches. Make sure that your chairs for your dinner table and your couches are durable, one, but also make sure that they can be cleaned because if they stain easily or you can't get stuff out of them because of the type of fabric, you're gonna have a problem there. Now, you can use 3M's Scotchgard and spray down anything fabric. So if you have fabric chairs or fabric couch, use Scotchgard and do this regularly. Like every couple of months, do a cleaning and then Scotchgard them. You can add this to your deep cleaning schedule. And if you don't know what a deep cleaning schedule is, join my course Cracking Superos because not only do I teach my five-step cleaning system for housekeepers so you can train your housekeepers from scratch, but I also teach my deep cleaning schedule, which is a calendar of deep cleaning activities that should always be done on Airbnbs in order to maintain listings in top quality. And this is important because if you don't maintain your listings, they will slowly degrade and your five-star property becomes a four and then a three and then you start to lose bookings. You don't want that to happen. Don't invest in a new property and let it die in a year and a half because you didn't maintain the home. Deep cleaning schedule. That actually leads to an interesting one, cleaning supplies. If you hire your own housekeepers like we do, we give them a cleaning caddy and that bad boy is loaded with everything that they need. If you skimp on cleaning supplies, your housekeepers cannot do a proper cleaning and they will cut corners because they have to. When it comes to maintaining the home, and housekeeping supplies, make sure that they have everything. Things for the bathroom, things for kitchen counters, things for stainless steel. Make sure that they have those cool little balls that trap up hair in the washer and dryer because if otherwise the sheets come out and there's gonna be hairs stuck in the sheets, 
your guest is gonna complain. So make sure that your housekeepers are fully equipped and don't skip on that and you'll be so happy because that cost comes back to you down the road in cleaning feet refunds. You either save money now and pay it later or you pay now and prevent bad reviews and refunds. I'd say there's a unique pro tip hidden within this talk about what to spend money on. You should pick a competitive category and go in that direction. What I mean is you could become infant and child friendly. You have like baby gate, uh, you have like a crib, you have kids play toys, and you really just go in that direction. Otherwise you become pet friendly and you have cute dog bowls and other stuff that like pet owners would like, treats and stuff. I haven't owned a dog in 10 years, guys, I'm sorry. And I really miss that, I wanna be a dog dad again. I would buy two German Shepherds right now if I wasn't traveling so much and I could have a better conversation with you about what dog owners want for their homes. But you can go in that direction. You also need extra types of cleaning supplies. That's a big thing we've noticed if you're pet friendly, you really need to get into the maintenance side of that. Scotch guard, one more time. You can also really deck out the kitchen. You can go full on pampered chef, um, kind of like Martha Stewart style kitchen and really appeal to the, the cooking family. That is another angle you can go. You can theme a property, that's another expensive angle and a lot of people are like should i theme my space and whether or not you should is really a, a math equation if you have a bunch of competition in a city and you're not sure to theme you can look at other people's designs and if they're working or like if they're not working if you think that the neighborhood could use something different but then you have to analyze the theme that you want to do let's say you want to do a mario theme or a marvel theme or a local sports team the amount of money that you spend extra to theme a home needs to be able to come back in increased revenues so if you think that the market has this underserviced pocket that a themed property will get people to go and spend money, then do it. I did a unicorn themed property in Philadelphia and it was performing like a two to one cash ratio to any of my other properties, but bachelorette parties were so like rapturous that we got shut down in six months. So there's a return on investment implication there. Be careful on the theme you pick, because uh, people might really enjoy the theme. And we had a problem, that was like three years ago, I think in Philadelphia. So themes are an extra cost. And if you can justify that with a good ROI projection, then go theme. But that is one of those other pro tip ways that you can really invest in one angle of a home. When it comes to the bathroom, there's not a ton to be said aside from people do care about the quality of the towels and they care about the quality of the toilet paper. So make sure you're good there. A little idea is you can have a, a feminine care kit in the bathroom and that is really charming. If you do something like that, people will bring that up and they'll give you a five-star review. Even if you screwed some other stuff, they can see that and go, wow, I really feel seen or heard there. Smaller listings are really cheap hair dryers, fine. And when we go with bigger listings, three bedroom or higher, we'll put a better hair dryer. We'll put a hair straightener in there as well. And of course, we'll expand that toiletries kit to include more stuff. So that way the home is more like a home. And this is a big distinction here is that when you have small studio, one bedroom apartments, people expect a more hotel like experience. It's just small. It's an efficient thing. It's quick. But with bigger properties, people really do want to feel like it's a home. So you do have to start spending more money as the listing gets larger to really make that distinction, right? Because people want a home. It's very much obvious that people can't stay in a hotel when it's groups of 10s or 12 because they don't want to book for four units. So now the competitive distinction between you and other homes is how much of a home is it like? Where if you're booking a studio apartment or a one bedroom, people will choose a studio or one bedroom apartment over a hotel because it's got a full size fridge, it's got a full kitchen and it has more square footage. You could just simply be on an apartment and get booked over a hotel based on preference alone. There's no necessarily like big competitive advantage of making it a home, but with houses, you're competing against other homeowners and I really think that that is a big distinction. So this last one, I've been speaking to my students largely on this because it's a really big topic lately, which is how to really stand out against other hosts, right? Other properties, because there's oversupply in some cities. And Houston was like terribly oversupplied, but I think a lot of people quit. So like the 35 or 55 properties we added while I was at Burning Man are all Houston. And we've got 20 more on the way. We're also adding some stuff in like Waco and other ones in Austin and Dallas. And we might even have 120-ish properties on the line, but specifically we're pushing into a market that is notorious for being oversupplied because I think there's some washout. But to the point, if you're going to compete in a saturated market like Austin, then you need to find a way to break through the white noise. And I've been saying, this is my theory, it's been playing out, that the last frontier for competitive advantage is underserviced amenities. The last frontier for competitive advantage is underserviced amenities. I said that twice for a reason. Simplified, there are very few houses with a gym. So if you look at search parameters, combinations, right? Well, I want a four bedroom house, but I want a gym. And you go search, there might be two. Well, hey, I would love a property with a hot tub. That's always gonna win. 
You always win with a hot tub. You always win if the house has got gym equipment. If the house has got garage parking, that's also a big win also. Uh, certain places people want fireplaces and stuff like that. And there's a way to find these guys. If you go onto airbnb.com and just search a city, right? Just go search Philadelphia, bam. There's gonna be these bubbles at the top. There's probably gonna say instant book, free parking, gym, hot tub, something like that. But then you go to Denver, Colorado, or you go to Winter Park, Colorado, the bubbles at the top change. Airbnb is dynamically restructuring the bubbles at the top for people's most common searches. So you can find in a certain neighborhood or certain city, what like amenities are the most competitive? What are the ones that people want the most? And start searching those and see which one drops out all the listings. Because if you click pet friendly and you go from 300 listings in a neighborhood to two, and there's nothing pet friendly, that's an underserviced amenity. If you can't compete with luxury properties, like blow for blow, you can go pet friendly and all of a sudden you're there. So examples of underserviced amenities are pet friendly, gyms, hot tubs, and then disabled accessible, ADA. Those are really common ones that you can go through to um, service people who obviously need something that nobody else is providing. So that's it for thought guys. Thank you so much for watching this video and I'm out. I'll see you guys on the other side.